We are continuing this morning to look at the multiple dimensions of sin. We have seen various dimensions of sin so far in this study. I'll recap them for you very briefly. We have looked at the fact that sin is diabolical, that sin is defined, that sin is directional, that it is diffusive, that it is divisive, that sin is domineering. And last week we examined the fact that sin is deceitful. Now, one of the most evils of sin, actually, it is the most evil of sin, is that aspect of sin where we have examined already that it is directional. And in particular, its direction, as we saw, as David said in Psalm chapter 51, verse 4, sin is against God. That is the most evil aspect of sin, that it is against God, who, as we have sung this morning, and as the angels declare today, who is holy, holy, holy. That's the heaviest weight of the evil of sin, that all sin, Small sins, what we would say are small sins, and what we as humans would say are large, significant sins. All of them, the smallest to the greatest of them, are all aimed at God. And in God's vocabulary, as far as that which is aimed against Him, which encompasses all sin, there is no small sin or great sin. It's all aimed against Him. And that is the evil aspect of sin. And the greatest weight of sin is found in that aspect, that it is aimed against God. Now, although the directional dimension of sin contains the greatest weight regarding the expression of sin's evil, and although all other dimensions of sin derive their weight in their expression from this directional aspect of sin, it is interesting to note that it is not in this dimension that we first and naturally come to experience or realize the evil of sin. And the reason for that is simple. The directional and the weight of that direction of sin being against God and its evil against Him can only re be realized genuinely by faith. By faith. It is in this next dimension that our natural minds, our thinking, first experiences the evil of sin. And that is through its destructive dimension. Its destructive dimension. This is the natural condition of man. And that is where we all began. As created beings, we generally measure the evil of sin by the negative impact sin has on the lives of people and on our own lives. We're all continual witnesses to the trial and misery sin leaves behind. We hear the cries of those sin hurts. We see the misery 
in the lives of those that sin ravages, we see their suffering, we see the damage, we experience it ourselves. Christians, we're not immune to the destructive elements of sin in this life. Whether it is our own sin or the sins of others. And it is in that destructive aspect of sin that the mind first becomes aware of the reality of it. Now later, once we have been born of God, we see that that weight of sin is actually stemming from a greater weight, and that greater weight is the fact that, as we said, all sin is directed against God. We look around this world, and we know of people who are incarcerated in a cell, in a prison in a place where they have now lost their freedom. And we see the destructive dimension of sin in their lives. And furthermore, we become aware of the destructive dimension of sin whenever we understand a person experiences capital punishment because of their sin. Their sin was so vile, their sin was so cruel, so destructive, that they themselves must be put to death. From the very beginning of the creation, before sin even entered the world, God warned the first two people about the dimension, the destructive dimension of sin. Look in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 2. Verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From every tree or from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Look at verse 17 again. For in the day that you eat from it, there's the sin. The day that you do what God has commanded not be done. The day that you sin. The day that you transgress. The day that perversion exists in your life. You will surely, and there it is, die. The destruction of sin. To eat. From the fruit was a violation or a transgression of the command of God, and therefore a sin that resulted in destruction, and here it is death. And as sin entered the world through one man, we know that sin and the destruction aspect of sin spread to all mankind, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Whenever you just take a brief glimpse of our world, the miserable presence of sin and the effective aspects of it become evident. Pain, suffering, loss, grief, and on goes the list. These destructive aspects and effects of sin were immediate. Here, Even Adam and Eve lost their formerly sound relationship 
with God. In Genesis chapter 3, look at verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God coming or among the trees of the garden. Their relationship with God was lost. They suffered disruption in their own walk with each other. The destructive aspect of sin was evident. In verse 7, take a look at the text. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Quite the contrast from chapter 2, verse 25, that says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. In verse 11, God asked Adam, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you to eat, you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. As we have said countless times, you can see the destructive element and aspect of sin here. This dimension of sin was part of Adam blaming God and then blaming the woman for his sin. God informed both Adam and Eve of some of the destructive miseries they would count, encounter because of their sin, and that starts in verse 16 and goes through verse 19. All of those elements, destructive elements of sin, would be evident in their lives. And then came for both of them the loss of the paradise of the Garden of Eden. As God banned them from the place and made it so that they could not return. And then after they left the garden, as you are aware, outside of paradise came their firstborn son in Genesis chapter 4, continued to exhibit the destructive aspect of sin as he killed his brother Abel, the second son of Adam and Eve. And then for 1,600 some odd years, 1,650 plus, from the time of sin's initial entrance into humanity right up to the flood, sin's destructive dimension continued to work in and on the creation. God wasn't silent during that time. He spoke of the coming judgment. He raised up a man by the name of Enoch. Enoch was born whenever Adam was just over 600 years of age. Enoch prophesied of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in Adam's day, he preached that Christ one day would come and that Christ would destroy the wicked because of their wickedness. That's in Jude, verses 14 and 15. And then there was also Adam himself. He could have clearly verbalized the destructive dimensions of sin up to not only Enoch, but even beyond. There was Noah in the book of Genesis chapter 6, who according to the New Testament was a preacher of righteousness. And for 120 years prior to the flood, he preached of the righteousness of God. And obviously, the need for man to repent of his sin because of the righteousness of God. And it was with reference to the end of that time from Adam's creation, 1,600 years later, that the Bible says that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And then destruction came. Destruction came a monumental display of the destructive dimension of sin in the flood, where every human being and everything that breathed air 
that breathed life, with the exception of those in the ark, were destroyed in the flood. An innumerable number of people. And then even after that, shortly after Noah finally left the ark, the destructive dimension of sin became apparent once again. You remember that Noah planted a vineyard, and he took of the grapes of that vineyard and developed from those grapes wine. And that resulted in him becoming drunk, and he was exposed before his disrespectful son, Ham. And that led to the cursing of the descendants of Ham, who became the Canaanites, who would become Israel's enemy. And because of their sin, the Canaanite sin, the destructive elements of sin would be displayed again as they were to be destroyed. That's just a few of a multitude of biblical illustrations depicting the destructive nature of sin. All of those and many, many more, as you're aware of, display the destructive nature of sin, and they testify to the evil of it. As a matter of fact, you cannot hardly read a page in Scripture where the Bible doesn't speak of sin's destructive character. We could spend all day here. We started in the third chapter, actually the second of the Bible, to see its destructive element. And it just grows and grows and grows beyond that point. We could say that the pages of God's Word are replete with the examples and warning against sin's destruction. And when all is said and done, the finality of sin's destructive dimension is summed up by the revelation of God in Scripture in a single word. A single word. Death. Death. God told Adam, there in Genesis 2 as we read, in the day that you eat from it, that is from the tree that he had been commanded not to eat, he said, you will surely die. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 4, says, The soul who sins will die. It's stated again in the same chapter in the 20th verse, The soul who sins will die. That ultimate aspect of the destruction, destructive dimension of sin is death itself. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the first part of the verse, the wages of sin is death. 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 James chapter 1 and verse 15, And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, whenever it is finished, brings forth, another version says, gives birth to Death. Death. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, speaks of the lake of fire, and it is the second death. Second death. Revelation chapter 6, the four horsemen mentioned in the first few verses of the chapter. The first horse, the white horse. The false Christ who comes, the second horse, the red horse, the horse of war upon the earth. The third horse, the black horse, the horse of famine and suffering. And then finally, that fourth horse, the pale horse, the ashen-colored horse, has this name, death. Death. 
And behind that horse, Revelation chapter 6 says, is Hades scooping up the dead. Scooping up the dead. Death. Sin's destructive blow. Death. It's interesting, we live in a world today as common as death is, death's been minimized. As a matter of fact, the very text that I was referring to in Revelation 6, whenever you see in Revelation 6 that a quarter of the earth is destroyed whenever that pale horse comes, you move from Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 9. And you see in Revelation chapter 9, armies gathering together. And those armies kill a third of mankind. Revelation 6, that ashen horse, a quarter of mankind are killed. Revelation 9, a third of mankind are killed. Incredible numbers slain in a very short time. What's the significance of that? Consider this for a moment. Right now, in the world, the population is approximately 8 billion people. Just a little over 8 billion. That's a lot of people. If a quarter of them as depicted in Revelation chapter 6, under the ashen horse are killed, you're talking about, in a very short period of time, two billion people perishing. Two billion people. Now, if that two billion that perishes is a different group whenever you come to Revelation chapter 9, you're left with six billion people. If the world's population then is 8 billion, it's probably more or going to be more. In 2021, the population of the world was 7 point something billion. It's increased to 8 point something billion now in two years. If in Revelation chapter 9, that third that is killed is a separate part, then you're talking about two more billion people perishing. And you read a strange thing in Revelation chapter 9, that even though a third of the earth has been destroyed by that war that takes place there, the Bible says that the people did not repent. They witnessed an incredible and incomprehensible, they will witness an incomprehensible number of people suffering death. And yet they will not repent of their sorcery, of their murdering. Sorcery is a reference to their drug abuse. They will not repent of their thievery or their immorality. Even though they've witnessed Two billion people perishing. You know, we get excited whenever a hundred thousand people perish. And rightly so. We should be concerned whenever one person dies. But can you consider for a moment the impact two billion people dying in a very short period of time, in less than for sure three and a half years, and most likely much less than that? the impact that should have. But those people, according to Revelation 9, will not repent, even though that transpired. One reason, I believe, is because the world's accustomed to it now. And death has been minimized. That destructive element of sin has been minimized. There are countless millions of people right now that have no problem putting to death the unborn. They're not only willing to do that, they are willing to vote to have it done. They're willing to pass legislation that promotes it and prompts it, and a soul is being destroyed. 
the destructive element of sin. The Bible never characterizes death as something that's to be minimized. As a matter of fact, turn in your Bibles with me for a moment to the book of Job, and there to chapter 18. Job chapter 18. Bildad is speaking here of the wicked. And in Job 18, I'm going to ask you to move down in the text with me to verse 12. Bildad's describing the suffering of the wicked here as he enters, as he's introduced to the king of terrors. Job chapter 18, verse 12. His strength is famished, and calamity is ready at his side. His skin is devoured by disease. The firstborn of death, that refers to the disease or calamity, devours his limbs. He is torn from the security of his tent. And notice the next phrase. And they march him before the king of terrors. The expanded translation of that verse refers to the king of terrors being death. 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 <laughs> it's not something to be minimized. The destructive elements of sin are all around us. The climactic part of it is death. First, we know as Christians there is a spiritual death that has already taken place and exists in all humanity. But even those who have been born again, those who have experienced the life-giving power of God through Jesus Christ, they're not untouched by the reality of death in the experience of this life. That's not to say that God's promises have failed. They have not. God has sent Jesus Christ, and according to Hebrews chapter 2, Christ has come to destroy him who has the power of death, the devil. Praise the Lord. But death is a reality, even in the lives of God's people. And it is not to be minimized. When you experience it in your own lives, that is, through the death or the loss in this life of someone, there should be an element of sadness in our lives. Yes, faith transcends the experience but it doesn't ignore it. The Bible doesn't ignore it. The Apostle Paul didn't ignore the reality of death, even when it occurred in the lives of those who were Christians. Look in your Bibles with me to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And move down in the text to verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier who is also your messenger and minister to my need because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Stop there for a moment. Look at this. You see the reality. As the fingers of death, of death are present here in this Christian's life, other believers were concerned over that. 
No doubt they lifted their voices to God and prayed to God for healing. Why? Because if God did not heal him, he would die. He would die. But notice it goes on. For indeed he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me. Now, Paul's the great man of faith, who said we walk not by sight, but by faith in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and indeed we do, but notice what he said. If Epaphroditus would have died, Paul said, and notice this in his own words, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Whenever a person dies as a Christian, there is a loss in this life, a real loss. Yes, there is a great advancement into heaven, and we celebrate that and praise God for us, but that does not ignore the reality of the loss here that comes from that destructive aspect of sin, death. However, as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, and I'll ask you to turn over there for a moment, we do not mourn as those who have no hope. Look at verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that is, those who have died, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. But notice he said, he didn't say we do not grieve. Just we do not grieve as those who have no hope. When death comes into the lives of Christians, there is grief. There is grief. Whenever Jesus witnessed the grief of those who lost their friend and brother, Lazarus, and he saw their misery because of that destructive dimension of sin, death, he wept. He wept. He gave them the truth, but he understood their loss. He understood their loss. He knew that they knew there was a resurrection. His own sister says, I know that in the end there's a resurrection. He understood that In this life, as far as they knew for then, that they would never again see Lazarus, that they would never again hear his voice, that they would never again sit down in this life to a meal with him, that they would never again get news from him or a news about him. It was over. Death is final. It's final. God doesn't minimize the importance of death in the lives of believers. As a matter of fact, He uses it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, He used it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says that it's an aspect of God's discipline. Speaking there of the Christian that is caught up in sin, God says that such a person is to be, to be delivered over to Satan that his flesh might be destroyed. That's death. 
that's death. But a spirit saved. Satan has the power of death, according to Hebrews 2. And Satan still wields that sword, and he does it often. And he can do it in the life of a Christian if God so permits it because of sin. Now, there are other reasons why Christians die. I know. But we can see clearly in that text that it is something still to acknowledge and not minimize. In Acts chapter 5, verse 11, God brought death into the church to a couple, Sapphira and Ananias. And the Bible says that after they died there in Acts 5, verse 11, that great fear fell upon all of them. They had a reality of the awareness of the destructive nature of sin, and that is its death blow. It's death blow. Sin is destructive. And we could go on and on and on. It should not be minimized. Sin or its destructive aspect, death. Even not by the Christian. We should be those who acknowledge the reality of it. The world is on its mission to minimize it. And in, in one sense, it has. As I already mentioned, they commit it and kill and seem to have little concern over doing so. And they're not bent these days on stopping it. but seem to be allowing it all the more, all the more. False doctrine, that is the deceitfulness of sin, has crept in and has caused many people to think that death is no big deal and that their false religion will get them through it. Even in evangelicalism, we have crackpots today going to heaven and going to hell and then coming back, as they say. They have died and come back to tell you about it or to tell others about it. They never die. The Bible says it's appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. They are false disciples of death itself. Someone might say, well, what about those in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New, that did die and were raised from the dead, such as I already mentioned, Lazarus, and in the Old Testament, individuals that died and were raised there. God is able to do that, most certainly. And He did those in those instances to validate His prophet or His word as the prophet spoke it. He did so to validate Christ and His Word. He did so to validate the apostles. Now it's validated with the reality of His Word. And His Word says, it's appointed unto man once to die. And then, the judgment. And then the judgment. And that judgment speaks to the second aspect of death's destruction, the second death, the lake of fire. And whenever a person experiences that first aspect of its dimension, as far as destruction is concerned, physical death, if their lives have not been changed by Jesus Christ, there is nothing left for them but that second element, the lake of fire. The lake of fire. Eternal death. Death that keeps 
its victim in its throes for eternity. Misery upon misery upon misery forever. The good news of God is this. In the rest of Romans 6, 23, the first is the wages of sin is death. Whenever it makes its payment, it pays with death. But the text says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death's destructive element is remedied in Christ. When a person believes in Him, they are recipients of eternal life. By virtue of His person and His work on the cross, they have, that is the believer, escaped, not of themselves, but of Christ death. Not necessarily physical death, but eternal death. Spiritual death. They've been made right with God. But they must believe in Christ and in Christ alone. The rich fool thought that he had many things stored up to make his life comfortable. He wasn't thinking about death. Even though it was prevalent all around him, even though no doubt his own relatives experienced, his friends experienced it, he hadn't thought of it. And then as Jesus went on to describe the parable of the rich fool, the Bible says of that man, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. Wow. You know what that was? Tonight, death is coming to your house. Tonight, it will not knock on the door. It will come in. And it will take you from your tent and it will bring you to itself. And God calls it the king of terrors. Now as Christians, we praise the Lord that we know the king of kings. That in Jesus Christ we have life. And all who believe in Him have life life. And that whenever we die in this life, as Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We will enter into eternal life. And so far as the immediate experience of that is concerned before the presence of God. We have it now. But that doesn't mean we need to minimize the reality of it while we're here. It's impactful. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning as we prepare to close. As I mentioned early on, we have deliverance through Christ. The Bible says that whoever believes in Him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon Him. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved from sin. And in particular, in the context of the message this morning, saved from sin's ultimate destruction. Death. Spiritual death. Death of being cast into the lake of fire. Praise the Lord. But let's not minimize the reality of death. 
because we know it's been conquered in Christ. Father, we thank you and praise you for your mercies, for your grace. We thank you for Jesus, who himself came and died to deliver us from death who gave himself on the cross and experienced physically what was due us. And in him and through him, you have blessed us so that we have the victory. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.